All right, what's up, psycho historians? Thanks for tuning in to another Phantology episode. I'm your host, Stephen, and Josh and I are going to be talking about Foundation. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I love this book. This was my first time reading it, first time reading anything by Asimov, so I'm happy to be here and uh, kind of telling you what I thought about this book. And yeah, same for me. First, first Asimov ever. Obviously very prolific. And I don't read a ton of sci-fi in general. Like if you've just seen what Phantology has put out, you've probably realized we are mostly fantasy with sci-fi every now and then. But we thought, you know, with the TV show coming out, I, I, we're going to try to get this episode out around the time that the show drops. So hopefully it's a bit of a primer. But, we, you know, we, we thought maybe it was appropriate time to cover something that is this beloved. Yeah. And uh, frankly, like I, this is a big blind spot that I consider like in myself as a reader, not just like in my relationship with Phantology. Like I've, I've been really wanting to dive into a little bit more sci-fi and we've kind of done that with, we did with Dune earlier this year, which I would consider more like soft sci-fi. And then now we're doing it with Foundation, which is mm -hmm. I think a little bit more hard sci-fi. Uh, yeah, Dune definitely more of like a space opera yeah. and yeah, but but both Dune and Foundation, you can see how they've influenced the sci-fi, especially like Star Wars is an easy example. Yeah, you get this galactic feel that I feel like you 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 get that a little bit more in Foundation than you do in Dune, whereas you get kind of this uh, a little bit more loose um, mechanics of like maybe some magic mixed with uh, higher technology. You get that in, in Dune. Um, more than you get it with foundation. So. so if you're tuning in and haven't read the book yet or any further books, because there are seven total foundation books, but each book is kind of this collection of short stories, at least the ones that I've read so far. I've, I've read the first and, uh, and the second, well, like half of the second. Josh, you've read the first two. I'm not really sure how what the structure of the additional books are. But if you're tuning in and you don't want spoilers, we're not going to do specific plot point spoilers, but we are going to talk fairly high level with some specifics about like philosophy and, and some elements. So if you don't want any spoilers at all, you know, we, we are going to talk at least a little bit. But the idea here is it's kind of like a primer to the TV show, which is coming out on Apple Plus really soon. Yeah, I'd say comparison to like Lord of the Rings, which I think it's fine to like spoil. I'd say we'd, we'd say something along the lines of like, yeah, the goal is that they're going to get the ring to, you know, Mount Doom and there's a fellowship like that. That's the kind of like general. We're not saying, mm -hmm. you know, specifically how it happens or spot, plot points or who lives, who dies, or anything like that. We're just going to be pretty high level. And found, Foundation is a lot more of an ideas book than it is a plot or character book anyway. So we are going to be talking about some of those ideas in it. Yeah. So if you're curious at all about the show and you've read a primer about what this thing is, that's about as far, it would probably be similar level of spoiler content. Yeah, and I will say that um, from what I've heard, the TV show might be covering some of the, uh, some the prequels, of the right? prequel, pre prequel books, yeah. which we have not read. So this isn't going to be like an absolute greatest primer about the show, because first of all, we're not like super confident in our material. Definitely like, not. You know, so, so we're not uh, sitting there um, picking apart the trailer, like say we would with Wheel of Time saying, oh, this is this scene. This is how they get from here to there. You know, this is kind of just a high level review of the first foundation book and trying to get hyped for the TV show. Yeah, kind of like what we are hoping for in the show after having read the book, what, what ideas we like, what we think would be cool to come on screen. And then just like some general things that maybe you should know going in so you're not confused and obviously we have no idea how confusing the show will be hasn't come out yet but there's you know with any sci-fi show sometimes a primer is nice yeah by the way this is a tangent i scoffed at the idea of apple tv but um we got a we got a new mac earlier this year and we got a year of apple tv and honestly like i've really been impressed with the quality of shows on apple tv so i was planning on getting for foundation anyway but just just throwing it out there. I, I kind of had to eat my words a little bit. <laughs> not yeah. not sponsored content by <laughs> Apple. <laughs> Man, if Apple sponsors, I take it in a heartbeat. But 
Um, I haven't seen anything uh, on Apple Plus yet, but I mean, after that glowing review, it Ted seems Lasso, like man. Ted Lasso, just saying, you're missing out. I, I think this is a perfect opportunity, right? I yeah. can I can sign up for a month uh, because of Foundation, and then just get all the other steps in, and and, and then cancel after that. Ted Lasso and Mythic Quest. It's like it's kind of like on HBO, like the Silicon Valley the like a combo of, of comedy shows. They're, they're pretty good. Anyway. Okay. Apple Plus. There you go. They only pay us one thousand dollars an episode. <laughs> oh, I wish. All right. What should we get into it? Yeah. So Foundation was published a long time ago, as you might expect. The, the uh, first book is actually a compilation of five short stories that Asimov published separately in kind of different publications from, from uh, my understanding. And the first thing, the first one that he wrote, I think it goes back as far as 1942. So mm-hmm. almost 80 years ago. And then these five short stories were compiled for the first time in 1951, exactly 70 years ago. So that's, I mean, this is old. This is, this is some very old stuff. So I guess just the fact that we're still talking about it shows at least how well the ideas hold up, how interesting the ideas are. I think some of the technology stuff, probably, you know, fairly outdated. And, and one of the things that I had a hard time reading the, reading the books, I was just like, yeah, this doesn't, you know, really make any sense because technology has advanced so much, so much further yeah, than, than uh, the state it was in when Asimov was writing the books, which is, you know, not a knock on him. Obviously it's unfair to think that you're going to write something and expect the technology to still make sense 70 years later. That's, that's not reasonable. And that's, that, please do not come away from this episode thinking that I'm trying to say uh, that is any criticism at all. But it's just a perspective. You have to like set yourself in the perspective you're viewing any work of art from, right? And yes. so it's you. it makes you suspend disbelief a little bit more when you realize that, okay, this isn't going to be how the future looks like because it's not how the present looks like and we're only 100 years out compared to thousands of years out. So I, I get where you're coming from on that. Um, it's not a knock on the book, but it's something that might have pulled, pulled you away and that readers might, you know, first time readers might need to recognize going into that. Yeah, and, and I have no idea how the TV show is going to do this. I suspect they'll probably try to remove that, that layer are people going to be walking around with Apple branded products because it's on Apple TV? Thousands of years in the future, you get like yeah, Apple has Apple taken over the galaxy it. at this point. <laughs> Everyone's got Macs. Yeah. All their, of their, their all of their is... messages are blue. There's no green messages <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> their spaceship is like has a big Apple logo on it. Uh huh. Oh man. Yeah, yeah very subtle. Tr- Trantor is just like in the shape of a big Apple with a bite out of it. <laughs> That's not off the table. That's <laughs> that's probably less of a joke than than you're thinking it is. <laughs> All right, fair enough. So so high level, what is this? What is this series? So, so high, oh, sorry, yeah, oh yeah, go ahead, go <laughs> ahead, you go for it. Very high level. This is a series about the galaxy thousands of years in the future, and um, a psycho historian uses. Um, some complex statistical modeling, or as it's called in the story, psychohistory, to predict that there's going to be a downfall of this galactic, galactic empire and going to be, uh, you know, 30,000 years of barbarism. Um, this all happens in the first mm-hmm. maybe dozen pages. So, so this is kind of spoilers for the very beginning of the book. And so this guy's name is Harry Selden. And in the show, he's played by Jared Harris. And so we assume that the the first season will be pretty heavily focused on this character. Mm-hmm. Which, which kind of brings us to the first point of what we're, what the TV show is really going to have to work on if it's going to be successful. And that is characters. Because in the book, first of all, um, I do think that uh, this this whole series, and I think you might disagree with me on this, but I think it gets a little bit too hard of a knock for having terrible characters. I think that the characters aren't great, but I do think that some of the dialogue is really well done. And I think that some of the first speeches and first interactions with Harry Selden 
um, are done exceptionally well. And it really like kind of grabbed me into the, into the story. Um, anyway. Yeah. I mean, so characters, I probably have less of a, <laughs> less of a positive take. Yes. The dialogue is good. Yes. There are different characters, but there's just like no effort to establish any backstory for many of the characters. They just kind of appear and this is the role that they play. And it's very clear. It's, it's very clear that the, the point of a foundation is not to build up any memorable characters. It's really about this whole idea of psychohistory and this modeling of the future and some of the, the, the kind of ethical questions that arise over the course of the establishment of the foundation and its struggles to survive. So no, I, I don't, yeah, I, I do disagree with you. I think the characters are, are, are pretty weak and I think the TV show is going to have to really do a better job on this because you can get away with this with a hard sci-fi book because it is very much about the ideas and that's interesting to read, but it's not nearly as interesting to just see on screen if you have no attachment to the person. I, I really agree. A good example of this could be Westworld. I haven't read the book, but um, they they really, and I've only seen the first season, but they really did a good job of layering very interesting characters on top of these very complex ideas. And I don't know if the book did that as well, but in the TV show, you had all these really interesting sci-fi ideas to think about, but it was done through a lens of very well-done characters. Um, so maybe they could take a, a few notes from from westworld and um, and i mean game of thrones is an unfair comparison because every new show gets compared to game of thrones but there are some similarities and actually uh jake another phantology member wrote this script that uh, i recorded a little video for that will be dropping before the show as well and the whole premise is can this show be the next game of thrones shameless clickbait obviously <laughs> Uh, on, on our part but uh, you know there's a little merit to it because there are these same like big sociological ideas of will the foundation survive and make it to the end and, and re revitalize um, the the galactic empire and that's kind of jumping ahead from our like yeah. 10,000 foot view of the series but th that is ultimately what the foundation's goal is um, and again, not much of a spoiler. You, you're going to find that out right away um, in, in a similar way. And this is similar to like who's going to sit on the Iron Throne. And in the midst of who will sit on the Iron Throne, there's all of these interesting characters throughout. And so if Foundation can do the same thing, great TV show. Yeah, I agree. As well as the visuals, there's a lot of amazing visuals in this in this show. The, the story starts out in, in Chantor which I referenced earlier, but it's a huge kind of uh, city with, I think it said like billions of people living in it or hundreds of millions. Yeah. And it's, I don't know the exact number. It may even been like trillions Brilliant. possibly, it like, yeah. but it's completely covered by man-made con construct, right? Yeah. Like people, uh, you're pretty much, yeah. And just an entire uh, don't, I picture it like the dome, but you're pretty much inside the entire time. There's and, characters who are like, I haven't seen the sky or like, oh, I saw it one time when I was a kid and it was really scary. So I don't like yeah. to go up too high. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I kind of picture it like the, uh, if you've seen Loki, like the, the what's the group of people on Loki? Um, the Asgardians? No, no, no. In the TV show, Loki. Oh, the, uh, uh, the history. The TVA. People. The TVA. Yeah. Like how you look out and yeah. it's all like one big uh society that's within like yeah uh, i kind of picture picture chance like that i mean it's also basically coruscant from the star wars prequels yeah that's true um but stepping back a little bit back to our uh little overview what do you think as a graduate student in statistics what do you think of this uh <laughs> what do you think of this idea that you can model kind of the entire like uh not individual actions but the, the trajectory of humanity. Um, what do you think of that idea of that concept? Because that is one of the main concepts in the book. What was that? How did that land with you? Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I feel like there are some flaws in it, but the idea, 
like the idea itself is like maybe theoretically sound you'd have to have obviously a ton of data <laughs> which apparently <Yeah>. <laughs> they're able to use their handheld calculators to <laughs> To calculate, there's scenes where he's like punching in numbers and calculating exact probabilities of successes and failures. Like, no, that is not possible. And and I think it's interesting that they say that they're. That there's times where they say like, yeah, we're we're just calculating the 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 large scale forecasting, which is reasonable. Like, I guess if you had if you had a if you had data that was properly curated and you had like some ability to to actually forecast which is tricky because the further into the future you go the more volatile uh, you, you know the more variability you're going to have uh the more the larger your error is going to be maybe but the whole time i was just kind of like scoffing because like in practice this it, you know in the year 2021 this is not this is obviously not possible well it's not possible but what about ten thousand years like if you have quantum computers if you have like a chip yeah. and everybody that can get exact maybe know, and, and the only way it's possible is if you do it in, in large scale groups and that was kind of the point of psychohistory is like we've they're modeling like large scale human behaviors and tendencies and, and groupings and not individual people's actions because can we like model can we model like a uh, wildlife um trends and like populations and stuff like that I mean, I know that that's just pretty much just like birth and death rate, right? But I mean, just taking that to like a larger comparison on humanity. Yeah, but know. in those cases, you're just forecasting like probably individual data points. You're not, you're not saying like, I think that the antelope are going to, you know, merge with the <laughs> other. <calculus. laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And so, but in this case, we're saying, the entire galaxy is going to collapse and these groups are going to be important. And these ones are like, these are the different factions. And the, the reason why I, I feel like there's a bit of a, um, of, of a, it, it, he breaks his own rules here because he says that they're only forecasting the large scale things, but then there are points where like at very specific time intervals, things happen. And we're like, Oh yes, he, you know, Selden predicted this at this exact moment, but that's not possible. Right. I get that. Like maybe you could predict some, some trends in, in a large culture or, or a large civilization, but not at a, any specific year with any kind of accuracy. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. That did kind of throw me out of it. It was a cool, uh, we'll, we'll keep this high level, but there are some cool scenes that happen but it is kind of rule breaking and when they happen, because you're like, well, this is the whole point is that, like you said, it's, it, you should keep it general and you can forecast trends, but not exact day or time. That, that did kind of throw me out of it, even as somebody that's not like as statistically versed as, as you are. Um, it's still, I was like, well, this isn't really what you set up. So fair enough. But I do think that in the forties, um, which is when a lot of, like the basic statistical models were being set up. Sure. Like the, the yeah. Lots of, is, yeah. Lots of the, the fathers of statistics were doing work kind of around that time. Yeah. I might have to bust out my textbooks or search the internet to actually figure out when the years were, but I mentioned it was around that time. And I know like the Turing machine and like the first functional, like really functional computers were, were coming um, around that time as well. I guess I'm just kind of thinking to that Benedict Cumberbatch movie, which was during World War II, right? Yeah. But but Turing is considered the father of modern uh, computers, I believe. Yeah, he is. I, I don't think that you had. I think that that was really this the time when you could you could expect a a um, like an algorithm to be able to perform any type of calculation repeatedly, you know, with any form of accuracy. Was so I, I don't know large scale. I think it's a pretty cool idea that was dealing with kind of the the cutting edge both statistical thought and yeah. computer yeah. thought so i it, i think it's cool um i think you have a good point that it's like not really realistic with our current understanding of statistics but Ag yeah agree that like at the time for sure this is very cutting edge this is very visionary and 
you know, probably seemed very possible, seemed like it was the next stage in evolution in the field. Now that we've, you know, gone 70, 80 years into the future, we know more about what the limitations of these types of models actually are. At least with our current understanding, like, what yes, yes. Yes, people are going to dig up in this podcast in 200 years and be like, those guys are idiots. <laughs> uh, if people are listening to our podcast in 200 years, then we'll have been a success. So take that. <laughs> um, all right. So we kind of got uh, the high level, what the main plot of this is, I guess, what the main conflict. I don't know. Well, I guess we didn't really get into the conflict because right now we just said that there's a guy that's predicting this downfall. Yeah. So, so, uh, what's his name? Um, yes. So Harry Seldon is predicting the fall of the galactic empire. It's happening really soon. It's imminent. We cannot avoid it. And so he sets up this foundation kind of at the edge of the galaxy. And this is where then, then later on that. So each of the four, the five stories we should say takes place over a kind of different chunk of time. There are some characters who are in both. Actually, I think just the second and third short stories have some characters that are in both, but they're they're fairly separate. And so that's another thing the show's going to have to deal with, just the time jumps and how are they going to do that? Are they really going to have each season have like an entirely new cast? Could be interesting. Maybe we kind of table that if we want to talk about the TV series later on. But uh, yeah, the, the bulk of the action takes place then at the foundation, kind of at the edge of the world here as these guys try to deal with, you know, Selden is his time has passed and now they, they have to deal with making this foundation survive and essentially acting in whatever way Selden has predicted without really knowing what the specifics of this, these predictions are. So that's, that's interesting as these, these guys kind of like blindly stumble through. And one of the things is that uh, Selden can't tell them what he's predicted. Otherwise their actions will be, almost predetermined and it won't, you know, his calculations won't work, which makes sense. Yeah. You yeah. You obviously the, can't bias. That's someone. a valid statistic. You can't do have a co-found or what the uh, confounding variable or what's the co covariate. Well, I mean, you would, you would just be biasing the experiment yeah. if someone knew um, what the predictions were. Fair enough. Yeah. So that was cool. And uh, as we've been talking about it and we talked a little bit about this um, earlier, is this is kind of for w- one thing is the followers of Harry Seldon throughout the book kind of more into like this religious uh, undertones, right? It's kind of seen as Seldon was a genius and maybe like more than more than a man in some ways, like he was very inspired. Um, especially as we get further and further throughout the the book series. Um, and throughout the the first short stories like they they talk about this reliance on cycle history as almost like something you have faith in versus something that you uh, should be seeking to understand and so I, i thought that that was cool how we get introduced to this hard kind of conceptual uh science that then morphs into something that people are basing faith in and their actions are guided by more of this faith in this idea that this man created than uh Mm -hmm. yeah then it's being seen as a science yeah and and uh maybe this is kind of where we talk about the the allegory here to the roman empire because uh that that does seem to be what it is there's probably i'm pretty sure that's like definitively what the a lot of these ideas are based around you know we have the collapse of the big empire and then time passes and religion emerges and the whole uh, foundation kind of um, expresses, flexes its muscles by providing technology and, and then leveraging this as if it's a religion to these, these, these surrounding empires, not empires, but these surrounding kingdoms, which are just little planets. Um, and, and they use, they, they act like they are a religion. And then um, there are some conflicts where you see the the weight of this religious power, and then some more time passes, and then it becomes more of a a trading and a mercantile power as well. And I imagine as we go, you know, if we were to read further into the series, there would be you know further evolution of the foundation until uh, ultimately 
um, there, there must be some resolution because I guess, uh, you know, at the end of the foundation book, the, the conflict is not resolved. And honestly, I don't know at what point the final conflict is resolved. And I, I don't know at what point, uh, like the thousand years is up and we know if the foundation succeeds or not. I, I'm guessing at the end of the first trilogy, because I think the first trilogy is, is really kind of like boxed together and that must resolve the majority of the conflicts. Is that what you'd want to see moving forward with the series? Is the is if the foundation is able to succeed in its goal of being able to reduce the this you know yeah. barbarism? Yeah. yeah, that's that's what the payoff for you would be. Yeah, I want to know who gets the Iron Throne. I want I want to know does the foundation work? I, so that was the whole thing. Um, he said after one thousand years, my foundation will have succeeded and brought back the the empire, and things will be great again, and civilization will be restored. Well. Like, does it work? That, that's the whole premise of the book. And I would like to know. And I think at the end of the, the trilogy, we have that question fully answered. So you don't you don't want to just be who is the best story? You want it to be a, a little bit better resolution than that? <laughs> better resolution than the end of Game of Thrones, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just... Yes, I do yeah. want it. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, and so what about... Um, what we kind of t- touched on this a little bit earlier, but do you think the characters are like the the weakest part of this, or was it was it the the pacing, the characters? I mean, I, I don't. I'm getting the sense that you didn't like it quite as much as like I did. Which yeah, um, I I don't. I mean, it was it was an interesting read for me, but not necessarily a page turner. I thought the ideas were the strongest the strongest thing that stood out characters the characters all kind of morphed into one character it seemed like every short story there was like a main a main character and this guy just had a different name essentially through every different thing and there wasn't really too much different about about this main guy i mean there was the the stories were different but there was no like no real difference in terms of characterization it doesn't help that i've been I read this sandwich in between a bunch of Joe Abercrombie books, which is all about the characterization. So I was like, what, what is this? This is, this is not, this is not what I was expecting. Uh, so yeah, characters, I think we, we already kind of talked about that. We're hoping the TV show does better with that. And, and they're going to like, Apple's not stupid and people who make TV shows know that we watch for characters. Fair enough. What, what about the pacing? I, I feel like, the pacing was harder for me than the characters. And I feel like that that is because of the sandwich short story format. Um, I think if I would have read these as individual short stories, you know, maybe sat down with one reading and one reading and read the short story, next reading the st- short story, versus how I did it was I kind of just like read it and then stopped when I needed to. So uh, I feel like that's what the pacing kind of messed with me. Yeah. Even more than the characters messed with me. Yeah. And I wish I would have known that going into reading foundation because yeah I, I would finish one and be like okay like oh well, there's this big time jump I guess it's just chapter two but in yeah. reality knowing that they're separate published works gives me a little more context and I think that would help me appreciate it a little bit more definitely if I was ever going to do a reread of this I'd like want to do it in you know maybe not one sitting but have some more distinction between these short stories than just seeing it as different chapters in, in a book. Yeah, yeah, agree. Agree, because yeah, it's definitely, and this is kind of how it was done back in the day, right? Like it was not meant to really ever be put together until it, it was. Well, and we saw this change pretty soon because I don't know if, well, okay. How would this compare to um, Wizard of Earthsea? Because that was published kind of, it was, it was, a, was that in the 50s? Um, Earthsea, I should probably know this since I just reviewed it and claimed to have, have read, I, I mean, I did read it, but I think it was more like 60s, I oh, want to say. I hope that's right. Okay, fair enough. What, would you say- There was a similar feel. There was a similar feel okay. where every chapter kind of felt like a different short story. Although I, th- that was not the case in Wizard of Earth. They were just like little kind of different chunks and they're, it was the same character all the way through, but just kind of like, okay, here's adventure number one, here's number two and so on. So yeah, a little comparable. So maybe that was just kind of, 
that that was more of the narrative style. Right. Fair enough. I, I, and I, again, we're 80 years out from this. So, I mean, obviously things are going to change. Mediums are going to change, you know. Um, but I, I, I think that it's, uh, I really liked it. Like I, I kind of have stayed away from giving my opinions too much, but especially the very beginning of this book, when the, all the ideas were introduced, it really was gripping to me. And I kind of, by the ending, I think my uh, feeling went down a little bit about that. Because again, maybe some mismanaged expectations on my part about the, the pacing of it mo- mostly. But um, I'd say that I would definitely recommend this for readers that are really into ideas and the length, frankly. It's not very long, you know, but sub 300 pages, 280 yeah. pages, I think, yeah. is what I'm saying yep. on Wikipedia. So like if, I, if I knew somebody wasn't a big reader, but might be interested in getting into kind of some classic sci fi, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend this. Yeah, and, and probably someone who's more of a, I mean, it's not necessarily a prerequisite, but you got to be more of a deep thinker. You have to be able to kind of stew on these ideas for it to be interesting. Other, otherwise, it's, you know, there's not much action. There's, there's probably only one of the short stories where there was anything resembling like adrenaline pumping excitement. Otherwise, it's mostly just kind of talking back and forth and political stratagem. Fair enough. Along with, again, along with po- positioning these really cool settings, if you can picture them, you know, like uh, you're on it, some, sometimes it's taking place on a ship, sometimes it's taking place on a really cool city, sometimes it's taking place on different planets. So, so I feel like the settings were pretty decent. It wasn't like a Robert Jordan type thing where he's going to describe every little, you know, thing in the setting. But I do feel like there's enough where that you knew there's enough going on that you could picture it and have an idea of this cool sci-fi setting that was going on. So I think that that's another thing that this show can really play on and have enough like uh, liberty to bring this vision to life and not get picked apart by fans. Like is going to happen with a wheel of time. Like, Oh, there's not mm-hmm. the right number of chim- the chimneys on the wine spring in. How dare they, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this won't run into that problem, but they yeah. can still create some pretty stunning visuals. Yeah. I think everyone people are going to be more understanding that in order for a foundation adaptation to be successful, it needs to be like fairly radically different than the books because it's pretty obvious that different, you know, we, we need to have some differences with this different medium. I think most people are going to accept that in the wheel of time, but there's going to be some well, pretty hardcore fans who, like you say, are like, yeah, there's not the right chimneys or the, you know, the characters are, are not how I pictured them and people are already upset about that. So you know. I think I think the difference between this and the Wheel of Time now, I guess we're comparing the comparison that's coming up, is people grew up having the Wheel of Time very formative. You know, I mean it's being published in the 90s. Like a lot of people started reading books then. And so it was it grew up with them. Like there's not very many people still around that like started reading foundation in their formative years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you'd and, have to be hundred. And, and if there uh, are, and if there are, and you're listening, like congratulations to you, uh, older person who is hip enough to be listening to our podcast. That you know, please reach out. I would love to talk with you. We will send you merch. We will send you merch, <laughs> and we will also help you get an Apple TV set up account set up. We will be here. <laughs> hey, hey, no, 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 Josh. If they are tech savvy enough to be listening to Phantology podcast, surely they are tech savvy enough to, to sign up for Apple TV Plus. You know, I, I have a grandma, my, the grandma on Ryan's side, our, our shared grandma. I think she, she could, she might honestly be, she's not quite that old, but she might be qualifying for that. And she does, I think she has listened to our podcast before. So, okay. Anyway, there you go. Josh's sure grandmother. Let us know if you like foundation. <laughs> I should, we should actually reach out there. See what she thinks. Anyway. All right. Okay. Any more thoughts about that? I mean, I feel like that's a pretty good overview. Hopefully I, I hope we were true to our promise of not doing spoilers. I mean, obviously we did talk through some like high level plot things, but you know, I, I think this is a good primer um, for, for watching the show. And I think it's going to be cool. I think Apple is going to do a good job with it. And everyone loves space stuff. Space stuff is really cool on the screen. 
So I'm expecting to to be pretty pleased with the show. Yeah. Uh, one more thing that we kind of touched on, I'm just on the Wikipedia article. It says uh, that Asimov proposed to John W. Campbell that he write a short story that set in a slowly declining black empire based on the fall of the Roman empire. So apparently that is like uh, not just mm. speculation, but that was the inspiration for Asimov writing this trilogy or these, these series was the fall of the Roman empire. And lastly, that's kind of the last idea that we haven't really talked about that I did want to talk about is the last, you know, since the industrial revolution, we have our concept of uh, technology is that it's constantly evolving and that we are constantly getting more and new and better and mm -hmm. more helpful and more intuitive and more powerful technology, right? Um, that is like the only way that we see technology working, which is different than almost all of human history, right? Almost all of human history is stagnant technology. Yeah. That's some, yeah. You know what I mean? And that's really, I was reading this, it was a TED talk or an article I was reading that that's really kind of altered our perception of how we view time is because we, we view time in terms of progression of technology versus like, you know, 500 years ago, people, you know, they would have the same technology that their great, great grandparents had for the most part, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a complete tangent. But now we're seeing, um, a loss of technology. We're seeing what happens when people lose nuclear power. We're seeing what happens when people lose um, knowledge that they once had and the effect that that can have on a civilization, which is again, a really cool parallel to like, the Roman empire with like the loss of knowledge on how to build and maintain aqueducts and how devastating that could be to um, you know a, a country and a place. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is also a, a really cool underlying theme of these books. Yeah, and I like the idea of viewing the whole thing as an allegory because then that removed, once I started to do that, it removed my issue with the whole technology thing, like not quite being up to date because I was like, okay, it doesn't need to be because that's not the point. The point is the ideas thing and the point is is just a, a similarity to uh, what has gone before, but on this space setting now instead of on Earth. Yeah. Which again is a little bit like Star Wars and Dune, both. Like you, you get all these kind of allegories for, for hu humans set in space, which I guess is what makes these you know compelling and, and lasting mm -hmm. stories. That, that is that they really are touching on both, both these cool ideas, but also human nature and how human nature is going to interact with these interesting ideas. So I think it really succeeds with a lot of what it tries to do, um, and where it doesn't try and do things like have good or interesting or really compelling characters it doesn't really succeed there because that's not what i was trying to do so all right well if you're reading foundation just expect it to uh play to its strengths i guess and completely completely not even try on the weaknesses <laughs> all right fair enough all right well thanks for tuning in if you want to talk to us more you can hop on discord and let us know your thoughts about foundation the book series or foundation the tv series which will be coming out soon some of the ideas for this episode definitely came from other discord members we did a book club on foundation so we we had a, a little uh, voice chat over discord and and i blatantly stole some of those ideas because they were good ideas and um and i think the community members will uh, will be okay with that so Thank you, uh, Jason and Nathan, especially for, for your for your uh, input that maybe you didn't know you were giving to the episode until now. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry I missed that chat, but um, I, I hope to on the next one. And, and I'm excited about continuing on with this series. And I think also just a little bit of foreshadowing, I think that the characters are improved in book two, um, especially as you get towards the end of the book, Stephen. I think you're going to find that that is something that for me improved from book one to book two, so. Okay, well, thank you, Josh, for providing your insight. As always, I am Steven. And next time you are at the edge of the galaxy and this like weird group of scientists that seems really smart starts to mess with you, just, you know, just be part of it. Don't, don't mess back or they're, they're probably gonna kick your butt. Yep. All right, see you later. See you, Steven. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Phantology. 
If you'd like to let us know your opinions on all things sci-fi and fantasy, join our Discord. Invites are in the episode descriptions below. If you'd like to support the show, like these fine folks here, you can do that at patreon.com slash phantology underscore books. Patrons get early access to new episodes, exclusive postings, and exclusive Discord benefits. But of course, just listening and watching and sharing with your friends and family is support enough. Journey before destination all, 